So thank you so much for joining us. We are so glad that you're a part of our worship service today. And our goal here at Journey is that we are all taking steps along the journey. And to, at Journey, we have uh, what we call the three S's. That we want to start our journey with God. We want to strengthen our journey with God. We want to share our journey with God. And we truly hope that you were able to do one of those, take one of those steps today. So thank you for watching. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And if you would be willing to type the word welcome, if you're new to Journey, or if you'd just like to connect and send a prayer request, just type the word connect to our texting number, which is 920-315-7789. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next week.
Your name. 
your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrected.
if we're in the, the stage of life where we're just celebrating or if we're in those hard times that no matter what, Jesus, you are right there with us. We thank you for that. Thank you for your grace, for the cross, God, for sending your son for us. Thank you for that. God, we love you and we give you all the praise today. In Jesus' holy name. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Journey. Uh, those watching online, welcome uh, as well. Um, if uh, yes, if you are new to Journey, we encourage you to text the word "welcome" uh, to the number on the screen here nine two zero three one five seven seven eight nine. We'll send you a card to fill out, um, and then you get you acclimated to Journey. I also encourage everyone to text the word CONNECT to this number. Uh, this is our digital connection card. You can ask for prayer, ask any questions you might have. Maybe there's just something that you want us to know. Um, or, you know, I've been maybe you're thinking, you know, I've been coming here for a while. I'd love to start serving in a particular area. Uh, those are all great uh, uses uh, for the connection card. And also you can find this uh, through, the, through the Church uh, Center app that you can download uh, as well. Well, today we continue in our series, our Acts, Power, and Purpose series. Uh, we'll be doing uh, uh, chapter three, which Pastor Mark will be speaking on in just a moment. And last week we had some baptisms, a couple of very powerful stories uh, uh, and we're, uh, that happened through baptism and, and people were baptized. And we have a couple other baptisms coming up later this summer. If you would like to take that next step in your journey with God and to, and to be baptized, um, we encourage you to go to journeytopeer.com slash events um, or go to events in the app and there is a baptism interest form that you can fill out and select the day that you'd like to be baptized. Well, next Sunday is the Drive uh, Student Ministry Welcome Party. This is for those who are uh, middle school and high school um, and their families You have a chance to... To, to talk and meet with um, uh, Jordan and Emily, the Drive Student Ministry Summer Interns, and learn about the plans uh, for the summer. So if you could register for that, again, you can go to journeytopeer.com slash events or events in the app. There are a few ways that you can connect this summer um, in, in groups, and I just want to go over those briefly. Uh, we have Freedom Fighters that meets on Mondays. And this is uh, for those, um, for, for, for men to helping uh, overcome pornography and sexual addictions. We have uh, Changes That Heal by Dr. Henry Cloud. This is going to be facilitated by uh, Pastor Mark and, uh, and, and, and Becky. And this is going to be taking place on Wednesday evenings. Then we have a, a Women's Summer Book Club that Courtney Cho Lee is going to be facilitating. And this will be taking place uh, every other Tuesday starting June 12th, and then the guys are going to get together, uh, the men's group, uh, to talk about the Sermon on uh, the Mount. So all of these uh, details, again, they start at different times in June, are available at journeytopeer.com, this time slash growth groups, or uh, groups uh, in the app. Well, I'll tell you a little story about a farmer. Uh, there was a guy who wanted to, to take up farming, so he, he, first of all, he bought a farm, um, then he bought all the tools that you would need um, to, to farm. He bought a tractor, even bought some overalls and a hat. And he said, you know what, I'm ready. So the next day, he went out, um, he, he went out and he sat on his porch and he looked at his land. The next day, he did the same thing, did that over and over again for weeks. And then he went out to his farm field and wondered why nothing was growing. Well, obviously... Nothing was growing because he hadn't planted anything yet. In Mark uh, chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, uh, Jesus said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. So Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a man scattering seed. 
And we can't expect a harvest to, to, to come if seeds are not planted. And Jesus said the faith of the farmer by planting the seed, eventually a harvest will come. So if we plant seed in God's kingdom, we can expect without a shadow of a doubt a harvest. And one of the ways that we can plant seeds in God's kingdom is through our generosity. So if Journey is your home, we encourage you to uh, worship the Lord through giving in one of the following uh, ways on the screen. Now let's pray now as we continue on in the service. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for this day. Lord, Lord, that we can gather together. Lord, and we can remember uh, the sacrifice that so many have made in this country. Lord, and we know that uh, right now our country is hurting from this week's, uh, from this week's events. Lord, so we need your guidance now more than ever. Lord, and I just ask that uh, today as we open up your word, Lord, that you will speak to us in a way um, that you want us to hear. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Bigman. Dear Mrs. Cushman. We regret to inform you that your husband has been killed in action. The tragic loss of your son has shocked all of us deeply. I extend my most profound sympathy to you on the recent loss of your daughter, who laid down her life on the field of battle. It is nearly impossible to find the words to say to the parents of one who has been killed in war. Some measure of comfort may be derived from the knowledge that he died in the service of his country and in the defense of a peace-loving people. Her enthusiasm and discipline marked her as an outstanding soldier, and as such, she commanded the respect of the officers and fellow soldiers of this unit. I am confident that his devotion to duty, at the cost of all hell dear, will hasten the day when ruthless aggression shall disappear from the face of the earth. I am proud to have served with him. Our faith enables us to withstand the shock and grief of death. It is my earnest prayer that Almighty God will sustain and strengthen you in this hour of trial. While the loss of your beloved one will be a hardship, we know that no life is truly lost for those who have faith in God. To all of you who have received these letters of condolence, and to all the brave men and women who gave their lives in defense of freedom, we remember you and honor you today. Well, it's hard to imagine what it would be like to receive a letter like that. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe some of you have, or, or it's just, it's sobering. And um, we want to take some time to recognize that. It's Memorial Day weekend, and those who have served, and families who may still be grieving over someone they know or love that has died in service to our country. Um, I wanted to mention, obviously, what has happened in Texas this past week. I did send out an email on Thursday about um, an article from Focus on the Family, which was helpful to help know how to help our kids process events like this. And uh, by the way, if you don't get our emails, then uh, make sure you register with us. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to get those, things like that. We try to send helpful things out, not a bunch of stuff. So anyway, um, we want to pray for uh, our nation. I actually did hear this morning there might be another incident happening uh, in Tennessee. I don't know any details about it, but um, whether you're here in person or you're watching online, uh, let's take a moment and pray for our nation, okay? Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We thank you for the freedoms that you have given to us. We thank you for those who have gone before us and who have fought for our freedoms. We pray for the families that grieve, um, whether it's uh, someone that we know and love that has served and passed on, or we just pray for our nation. Lord, the things that are happening, the violence, uh, we, we ask that you would do a, a powerful work in our nation, bringing people back to faith in you. 
bringing people back, Lord. We, we ask for that. And may you comfort those who are grieving. Thank you for this time that we have to learn and grow and open up your word together. We need you, Lord, in your name. Amen. So just a quick thing that I've been mentioning recently. There's three things that I've been really trying hard to remember um, for myself, and I'll pass it on to you for what it's worth. Uh, as we gather together, there's the three things are, number one, we want to open the Bible together because we need to hear from God. We need God speaks, speaks to us through the Bible, and we need him now more than ever. <clears throat> number two is we, gotta, we want to love each other as we go because that is so important. Even people who disagree with us and, or we disagree with them or whatever, we want to love each other. And then number three, we want to remind ourselves that God has put us here for a purpose and for whatever reason, whatever season, this is our time, this is our generation, this is our, we're here right now uh, for a purpose and it's not by accident. So, um, so as we gather together, those three things I think are so important for us to remind ourselves that we put ourselves in a position to hear from God, okay? So what we're doing is we're going through this uh, series that's on the book of Acts. It's called Power and Purpose and we're going chapter by chapter and we're really excited about it. Uh, quick summary. So Jesus has obviously died on the cross at the end of the Gospels, and he rose again at the end of the Gospels, and Acts picks up where the Gospels left off. So after Jesus rose from the dead, he was alive, and he was walking on the earth for 40 days. And during those 40 days, he was, he was seen by over 500 people and they, they, they have evidence. I mean, they saw him with their own eyes. There's eyewitnesses and so on. And so um, then the Holy Spirit came. Jesus said to wait. He ascended up into heaven right before their eyes. And he said, wait, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to know what to do. He's going to give you the power to live out your faith and so forth, okay? Um, then we get to the we got to the end of Acts chapter two, and uh, Peter had just given this powerful sermon, and then it talks about this time of peace, you know, where they loved and served each other. They had all things in common. They had glad and sincere hearts. They're meeting together. They're devoted to the Word of God. All these things, and the Lord added their, to their numbers daily those who were being saved because people were watching this, and they're like, "I want that." I want to have that kind of relationship and connection with God. So they're watching it, and God was exploding the church, okay? The Holy Spirit came. Now, today, as we get into Acts chapter 3, well, it's interesting how often it refers to the eyes and what we see. So I want you to notice this. I mean, think about all the, the sayings that we have that have to do with the eyes. You know, like, like people might say, good eye, or you know, in, in baseball, or they might say, keep an eye on this for me, or you have an eagle eye, or uh, a bird's eye view, or you're the apple of my eye, or you're a sight for sore eyes, or all eyes are on you, or keep your eyes peeled. We have all these idioms and sayings and things about the eye. And interestingly, in the ancient Near East custom, thousands of years ago, there was a lot written about the eye, and they used to call it the good eye and the evil eye. And so it kind of depends on what you look through, whether you look through the good eye or the evil eye. I'll give you a couple examples from the Bible. Remember when Eve ate the forbidden fruit, when she ate that fruit? Remember what the Bible says? That it was pleasing to the what? To the eye, right? And Satan deceived her, brought a curse on the earth, and we call that the fall of humanity. In the Old Testament... There was, a, 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 every seven years, a landowner was to cancel all the debts uh, that people owed them, and it was called the Year of Jubilee, and it'd be this wonderful celebration, and people were set free from their debts. Uh, in Deuteronomy 15, verse 9, here's what it says about that. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the, the year of release is near, and notice this, and your eye look grudgingly on your brother, on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cried to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. So as year seven actually approached, and you look at your poor brother, you look at him with an evil eye, it's like that word, like your eye look 
grudgingly is rahahin in Hebrew, and it means evil eye. So, on the other hand, those who look generously upon those and want to help those and forgive their debts and so forth, they have a good eye. So there's a good eye and there's an evil eye. All this history, um, good eye helps those, forgives debts and so forth, and evil eye is someone who hoards things and unforgiving and so forth. So, in Middle Eastern culture, they believe someone could look at you and bring curses upon you with an evil eye. So sometimes they would actually have little jewelry or things to try to keep away the evil spirits that um, in, in that custom is what they believe. So all that to say is the eye is really important. Now, kids, um, does, does your mom and dad, for any kids here, your mom and dad ever give you kind of like the, the eye, you know, like, like, you know what that means? It means like, hey, I'm watching you. You know, you got to watch out. So it has to do with how we want to see. Now, Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, which means like sincere or generous, if you have a good eye, remember, they would have known all this Old Testament background. Your whole body would be full of light. But if your eye is bad and your whole body will be full of darkness, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So how you see a situation, how you view, is a a way of how you view God or the condition of your heart. So all that is biblical context because as we get into Acts chapter 3 today, we're going to talk about how they had that background going into this situation that we're going to talk about right now, okay? Acts 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now, for a Jewish person, a normal time of prayer, you, you, you meet for, you have a prayer service at 9 a.m. and, and uh, 3, a, 3 p.m., and then at sunset. And then, so they'd go into the temple. So Peter and John are going to the 3 o'clock prayer service, verse 2. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So beggars would, would usually go into high traffic areas, such as the temple, just like people today. I mean, you might see people out asking for money in front of Walmart or at a mall or something, you know, high traffic areas. And so that's what was happening here is they would, they would go out into the temple because they knew that uh, Jewish people, some of them, especially the Pharisees and so forth, they like to be seen by giving their money to a beggar. So uh, these religious leaders would want to, they like to be seen giving money away because it made themselves look good and so forth. So this guy is asking for money and he's fully expecting some cha-ching to come his way. And notice uh, what happens in verse four and five and just notice how many times the word I or some kind of version of sight is used here. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. I wonder if the guy right at that moment was like, oh, nuts. You know, like, but what I do have, I give you. And then he said this incredible miracle. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Notice what he did. He's like, first, he's like look at us. Hey, you know, like this thing? Like, look, look. It was actually really powerful. Look me in the eyes, what he's saying. You know, there's something really significant about looking someone right in the eye. Like when you talk to them or you're, you're connecting with it, like you're looking into their, their soul. Like it's, you're connecting when you look someone into the, right into the eyes. And so he's like, hey, look at us. And notice it wasn't because of them. He said specifically, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it was the power of Christ. It was not Peter. It was not John. It was not how good they were or anything like that. Verse seven, taking him by the right hand, 
he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk began to walk and then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God. So I just I'm I'm like imagining this now like like Peter is probably like he, he takes his right hand and I don't know like if it was me I'd be like oh lord I sure hope this works you know like you know and pulls him up and his feet and ankles were strong they were made strong and just imagine being there like like this guy who was always out in front of the temple everybody knew the guy now he's jumping around and dancing and praying I like, couldn't believe it I mean he's, what a sight this must have been and Luke who was a doctor he recorded all this in I mean He's a doctor. He's not going to just make something like this up. Like, this doesn't normally happen. He wouldn't say it as a doctor if it wasn't true. Verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them to the place called Solomon's Colonnade. So here's this guy who could not walk, was known for begging, is now jumping around, and people were absolutely astonished. They're amazed at what just happened. And he goes and he's like clinging to Peter and John, and he's, it's almost like a little kid, you know, like clinging on to their mom or dad's leg, you know? I mean, he's clinging to them. He's so happy and it was in Solomon's colonnade which is a reminder for the Jewish people of like the golden age of Israel so this was an an incredible miracle that just happened through Peter and John they would have remembered Isaiah 35 verse 6 which says then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy what an experience and now they're like, all these people are in shock and awe. They saw this incredible thing happen. And I wonder if they're like, well, Peter's like, okay, well, I guess I should address the crowd. Now, if you've ever taken like a speech class in high school or whatever, you know, like, you know, you know what they teach you to do, right? Within the first 30 seconds, they, they tell you to capture their attention, right? So you got to tell a story, ask a question do something. Well, this whole miracle was like the attention getter of, 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 for his speech. So verse 12, when Peter saw this, he said to them, here's, he starts it off, fellow Israelites, why, do you, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? Again, another reference to sight. As if by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. Peter's like, it's not because of us. It's not because we have done something. It's God himself. And then he goes into his second sermon that he's ever given. Now, if you were here last week, you know that we talked about the first sermon that Peter ever gave. And here's the good news. If you fell asleep last week or you didn't, weren't here, he gives the same outline in his second sermon. I wish I could just kind of give the same one each, you know, each week. But anyway, he gives a second uh, the, the outline, and it's, it's basically the same idea as the first. So here's, here's the first part of what he says. You remember this? Number one, God breaks into our lives and reveals his love to us. Remember how we talked about this? Same concept, different, different passages here. Verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. So God broke into the lives of these people who were listening, and he was getting their attention because he wanted to connect with them, these people, these Jewish people, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our forefathers. He's connecting them with Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the one from their old, they didn't call it Old Testament back then, but their Bibles, what they knew, what they understood. Jesus is our Messiah that we know and have studied. And Peter specifically uses the word servant, which they knew the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, it talks about the suffering servant. So they were making this connection. 
And it's so powerful because God sees us. Do you know that God sees you? There's one of the names of God. It, it describes how God sees us. God sees you. And you might feel like you're unknown, or maybe you feel like, what does God care? And maybe you're wondering, like, out of all the, the, you know, the, the people in the world and the universe and all the galaxies, like, does God really care about me specifically? Does he notice? The good news is God sees. God sees us. He knows us. And he understands us. God is always trying to break into our lives. Did you know that? Even when you turn your back on him, he's still trying to break into your life. Even, when, even if you, you know, you just tell God, I'm just, whatever, I'm doing my own thing. He's still trying to break into your life. So I was, uh, I was driving on Webster Avenue a few days ago. And I was, I was in Alloway, you know, like by, by the cemetery. And I, I noticed a f- friend of mine who was walking. And he was, and I was like, oh, I wonder why he's walking. He's a long way from home. He lives in De Pere. And so I'm like, so I, tr- I stopped. I turned into one of the back roads. And I was waiting for him. I was going to kind of wait for him. He walked a couple blocks. And then there's cars all over, you know, and waiting for me. And I didn't, you know, and I kind of just, I'm like, well, I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he's fine. So I left and I just went home. Well, the next day I said, hey, um, um, I saw you walking on uh, Webster the other day. Are you, was everything okay? And he said, yeah, I was walking home. I'm like, walking home? He's like, well, I just thought I was having a heart attack. I'm like, what? You thought you were having a heart? He's like, well, I got treated and I didn't have a right. I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I would have followed through and actually turned back around again and I felt horrible. I mean, the guy, he's fine, by the way, but um, just, you know, I saw him, but I didn't do anything about it. You know that God sees us, but he does something about it. We have a God who sees us. Sometimes we don't see him and we don't see him working, but he is always working, isn't he? So that was the first part. Now, the second part of his sermon here is that God tells us the truth about ourselves. Notice what he says. Notice how many times the word you is used here. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released by you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we, his disciples, we are witnesses of this. Notice how many times he says the word you. He was telling them the truth about themselves. Now, Peter was saying that there's Pilate, the Roman governor, he decided to release Jesus. The Jews rejected uh, Pilate's offer, released Barabbas, of course. Barabbas was a murderer. They rejected their Messiah. And he's like, but we are the ones, we've seen him alive. Like, we have seen Jesus with our own eyes. But he told them the truth. And sometimes we don't want to hear the truth. Or sometimes we, the people don't tell us the truth. So um, some of you might know, if you've been around for a while, you know this. So our, my, our first ministry, full-time ministry job, my first full-time ministry job was in Greeley, Colorado. I was a youth pastor there. And as I was there, uh, every once in a great while, maybe a couple times a year, the senior pastor said, you know, uh, hey, do you want to preach for, for me? It's usually like this low attendance Sunday or something, you know, like couldn't find anybody else type of thing. So I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I'm thinking, yeah, why not? You know, he's a little heady. You know, I like to be more practical. So I'm like, yeah, I could do something. You know, so I got all these things going on in my mind. Like, yeah, I'll, yeah, sure. So anyway, I, I, one Sunday I was, I, was, I was preaching and I didn't have much experience at the time. And uh, there was a, a pastor in the crowd who was like a pastor of pastors. He oversaw a bunch of churches and stuff. And so he, uh, he, he went up to me afterwards and he's like, man, Mark, that was great. You just, you're such a good speaker. You're this and that. I'm like, really? I didn't think it was that good. You know, like, really? Uh, okay. Um, so anyway, I just kind of remembered that sermon, tucked it away in case I ever were to need it again for some other time. And so a couple of years later, we were, uh, Becky and I were uh, going to an assessment center for church planting. So we're, we're talking, you know, they trying to figure out if church, planting a church would be a 
ever be a good idea for us. So they, it was like this four-day thing where these pastors, they walked around with clipboards, and they're like evaluating everything you do. And you have to share your vision and your philosophy and answer some doctrinal things and case studies. You get a psychiatric evaluation, all this stuff, you know? And, and then the, one of the last things that we had to do is we had to preach in front of them. So I remembered, man, this other guy, he thought this sermon was so good. I'm going to pull out that same one. So I, like, pulled out the same sermon, and, and I, I got up there, and I, like, you know, just, just preached through this sermon. And I could tell, like, these, like, 20 pastors or whatever, they're like, like, their heads kind of cocked, and they're like, eyebrows are kind of furrowed, you know, together, you know, <laughs> writing things down, and, they look up at me. I'm like, oh, I am wowing them right now. I know it. I mean, they are like shocked and amazed at how awesome this is. And they're like, writing more stuff down. And so they're writing all this stuff down. And then at the end of the, the four days, they tell you basically three things. They say, well, uh, either you can, yes, go plant a church, no conditions, you're ready to go. Or here you can plant a church, but here's some conditions, some things to work on. And then there's like, no, this is not for you. Do not ever plant a church. And so uh, most people got in the middle one, including me. And so they sat me down and they're like, well, here's some things you can work on. And you know what the number one thing they said I could work on was? You're preaching. <laughs> they're like, you got to work on being a better communicator because it stunk. They didn't quite say it like that, but they're like, um, you got to work on it. So they're like, you got to listen to these five sermons and evaluate this and have people videotape you and watch yourself and do all this stuff. You got to get better if you're going to be planting a church. You can't, you can't preach like that. Let's stop, you know. It's kind of at least my filter of interpretation of it. And so I just, I think of that story because, you know, I, I, if it wasn't for that feedback, I don't think we'd be where we are today. I mean, I, I, like we need someone to tell us the truth. Now, granted, I mean, the guy that was the visiting pastor, I mean, he was, he was just being encouraging, and that's awesome. You know, sometimes you got to be careful how we encourage people because you don't want to encourage someone and give them the wrong idea, right? Like, you still got to tell people the truth in a loving and gracious way. But anyway, we need somebody to tell us the truth about ourselves. Now, we got to be careful that we start telling one, this is what God told me to tell you and all that. I'm not saying that. We need God to tell us the truth about ourselves. And he does. And you know one of the things that God says? You're in serious trouble. You look through the pages of scripture like, you're in trouble because of your sin. Your sin has caused a wedge between you and me, God says. And God doesn't just wink and forget about it. He's like, oh, no big deal. That's okay. He's not this love blob in the sky like, oh, everything's fine. Yay, Rosie. No. Like, he's like, this is a problem. It's such a problem that I'm going to send Jesus Christ, my son, to go to the cross and be crucified for your sins. And he punishes sin. But number third part is that God offers grace. And that's the beauty of biblical Christianity is that God offers, he offers grace. He doesn't demand that we receive it. He offers it to us. So Peter goes back to the story of the guy who couldn't walk, and he says, verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man, here's our word, whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. As you can all say it with me, See, Peter didn't take the credit for himself. He wasn't like, oh, yeah, that was, <laughs> was totally me. You know, I just lifted him up. He didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. It was because of Christ. Christ through him. I've never heard Micah and Lydia be like, oh, that, that song, that was all me. That was just, that was, I'm so great. Never heard him say that. God gives us something we don't deserve. He gives us his grace. And we live in a culture that, it's like every message from our culture is about how great we are, how good we are, and how we can do things by ourselves and on our own and apart from God. And God will just be okay with it, right? No. He's not okay with it. But by his grace, 
He offers us. And I'll tell you what, you can have a spiritual breakthrough in your life if you're feeling stuck. You have a spiritual breakthrough. You know how you have a spiritual breakthrough in your life? When you understand that God gives us what we don't deserve. He, he offers it to us. He, he's giving it to us. But it leads us to number four. The gospel demands a response. Verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance. So this is part four of his speech. As did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. So Peter is, he's pleading with them to respond. He's pleading with them to change. And he calls them to remember prophecies about the Messiah. So look at a couple of these Old Testament uh, prophecies. This is, this is 700 years or so before the time of Christ. I'll show you this first one in Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says, I offered my back to those who beat me. Who does that sound like? Jesus, right? My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. 700 years before Christ was born. How about this one? Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did Jesus, who said that? Jesus, right? When, when did he say it? When he was dying on the cross. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, which both those words mean sin. It's a picture of Jesus, the coming Messiah, hundreds of years before he actually came. And Peter was trying to get them to respond. And remember we said last week, to not respond is a response. Let me say it again. Let's sink in. To not respond is a response. If you just think, oh, yeah, that's fine, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, that's a response. So how do you respond? Verse 19, here's what Peter says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And I want you to notice this interesting connection here between the word repent and the word refreshing. And you might think repentance is not refreshing. You couldn't be more wrong because the truth is, is when we repent, when we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins and we, we just say, God, I am so sorry of what I've done. I've profaned your name. I've seen things that I shouldn't. I've done things that I've treated someone that I shouldn't have in a terrible way. I've, I've treated my kids or my spouse this way or whatever it is. I'm sorry for the language I use. I'm sorry for drinking too much, going to drugs, going to porn, going to this, going to that, all these things. It comes a point where we say, I am sorry for my sins. God, would you forgive me? And you know what happens? Refreshment. Because for the first time, or maybe the first time in a while, you feel the forgiveness wash over you. Just imagine being cleansed, just a cleansing feeling being washed over because of Jesus Christ. Something powerful happens when we turn to Christ and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Times of refreshing, refreshment come. I see a lot of people, you know, just out and about and in our community, it's almost like they're catatonic or almost like zombies, you know, like they're, they're there, they're alive, they're breathing, but they're just like kind of dead on the inside, they're just existing. Repentance, turning to Christ, asking him to cleanse and forgive. I think we've, I don't know, I just feel like we've, as the church, you know, like, We've forgotten about the beauty of repentance because we all, the culture says that we're all good enough. We're good. We're good people. We're good this. We're good that. We do this. God's good with this. We can live any way we want. As long as I'm happy, as I can be happy, God's happy, everyone's happy. No, 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 no. We forgot about repenting as a part of biblical Christianity. The beauty is that when you do, if you do, God refreshes your soul with his grace and his love. 
And maybe the reason you don't feel refreshed spiritually today and renewed in your soul is because you haven't really turned or repented from some sin that you have lingering in your life. I just want to ask you, as we prepare for communion in a minute or two, have you turned to Christ? Have you turned to him to do that for you? Because refreshment will come if you do. The gospel demands a response to say, stay neutral, to try to stay neutral. Again, that is, that is your response. You've already made your decision. But you can turn at any time. And the rest of this chapter goes on to just describe in more detail about uh, trying to con- Peter's trying to convince the people to respond. And he goes back to Moses and Samuel and Abraham and the prophets. He's trying to convince them to respond, to respond, to respond. And I just want to ask you, have you responded? Have you responded to the invitation of Christ for you? And if you haven't, I just want to take a moment and ask you to join me right now. Would you just take a moment and just bow your heads, just close your eyes? I just want to invite you, just with, between you and God, to repent. And times of refreshment will come. Have you been stubborn in an area of your life? Just tell God that. Have you, have you defended what you've done or justified or whatever, your, your behavior, your thoughts, your actions, your attitude, how you've treated someone? Let's have some humility. Come before God and ask him to forgive you. You fill in the blank, whatever you feel it is. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Lord Jesus, thank you that you know us. I thank you that you see us. You see us, God. And you even see us in our sin and our stubbornness. You see us as we truly are. You tell us the truth about ourselves. And yet you still love us and you still care. So we thank you for that. And we are so grateful, God, for your grace. And I pray for every one of us here today that we would respond by asking you to forgive us. It's not something we do or deserve. Asking you to wipe out, to wash out that stubborn sin in our lives that we try desperately to hold on to, but you're asking us to let it go. Thank you, God. Do your work in us. For those of you who are here for the first time or or maybe for the first time have never asked Christ to come into your life, just ask him, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. By faith, I'm putting my trust in you. I want a new life. I want to be a new person because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we thought that today would be a perfect day given the text and given Memorial Day weekend for us to end our service with communion. If you're watching online, uh, I just want to invite you uh, to quickly go grab, um, if you have a cracker or some juice somewhere, you can go and join us if you're at home or at a campsite or wherever you are, uh, you can join us uh, in communion. And one of the things that we make sure to remind one another about is that uh, during communion, you don't have to be like a member of our church necessarily, but you should have come to this point in your life where you have asked Christ into your life because uh, he is the one, the reason that we gather, okay? So you won't want to proclaim something by participating in communion that isn't actually true or hasn't actually occurred in your life. So for those of you who have turned and trusted in Christ, this is a special time. Sorry about all the crinkling noises here into the microphone. Let me just get that over with just so that, there we go. So um, this is an important time, and this is what Jesus has 
invited and asked us to do over uh, until he returns, which he hasn't returned yet, so we're still doing it. It's a great reminder. It's an object lesson. I just want to be clear about something. These elements, participating in these elements, they don't save us from our sin. They don't remove sin from us. Only Christ and his work on the cross actually does that. But we do it in response to that. We do it because of what he has done. And we remind ourselves of his body being broken and uh, his blood that was shed. So in a few moments, uh, we're going to invite you to come on up. And you can take one of these elements. We'll hand them to you. There's a couple of uh, layers here. You can just hold on to it. I'll give you some instructions here in a little bit about that, how to, how to peel it off after the song is over. But hold on to it, and then we'll take these elements together. And um, whenever you're ready, it doesn't have to be by rose, whenever you're ready uh, during this song, feel free to come on up. Uh, if you come down these side aisles, and we'll hand you um, a, what do we call this, container with the juice and cup, and then you can just hold it until, uh, until all of us have gone, and then we'll take the elements together, okay? So let's pray. God, we want to slow ourselves down and we want to remember what is truly important. And what is truly important is the great sacrifice that you have made to redeem us. You're offering your grace to us and you're inviting a response from us. So Lord, as we participate in communion, we remember, we remember what you have done and we are so grateful for what you have accomplished to offer eternal life to anyone who would respond. We thank you for that and we remember that now in Jesus' name, amen.
arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. So in the first century church, as um, the Apostle Paul wrote these famous words that we utilize for communion, he said, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you haven't done so already, you can just take that top layer of the plastic off where the wafer is, and you can take that out, and let's take it together in remembrance of Jesus Christ. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So you can now carefully, because it could get wet, uh, open up the second layer there with the foil where the juice is, and let's take the juice, which just reminds us of his blood, and do it in remembrance of his great sacrifice for us. Would you stand? And we're going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great and incredible grace. Thank you for inviting us to your table, inviting us to participate with you, giving us a seat at your table that we don't deserve. So we remember what you have done, and we remember what you've accomplished. Thank you, God. May we live our lives in a way that honors and reflects you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. If there's anything we can do to serve you, to help in any way, just remember our texting number. You can connect with us. Uh, we would love to be praying for you or any needs that you have. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next week. If you could take your uh, cups with you, that would help us the cleanup process. There's a garbage right out the doors here. When I open my eyes, I can't believe it. How the world can look so different than we were dreaming It's getting harder to say I'm undefeated When the best my heart can hope for is breaking even